Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jasmine Allen, and I'm director and curator of the Stained Glass Museum. Um, and I have organised a series of spring artist hawks. Um, and we're delighted that many of you have joined us this evening for the last in our series by Petri Anderson. So without further ado, I will introduce our speaker for this evening. Petri Anderson, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. This is uh, all very new to me, but I'm looking forward to it. So uh, yeah, let's, uh, let's jump. To jump well, before, before you before you kick off and start there, I was just checking your sound was working. I'll say a little bit um, to introduce you, Petri, um, because I, I know that many people joining this evening will be very familiar with your work. Um, you're an astounding um, glass artist. Um, so I'll tell people a bit about your background and then um, hand over to you. So Petri Anderson, who's an associate master glass painter, studied restoration glass painting under Peter Archer and Alfred Fisher in 1989. And in the late 1990s, he succeeded Peter Archer as head designer and painter at Chapel Studio in Hertfordshire. In 2005, he established his own studio, Mongoose Stained Glass, and he undertakes domestic work as well as ecclesiastical commissions and restoration. Um, and Petri's work can be seen across the country in churches, cathedrals, private homes, schools, cottages, uh, colleges and city livery companies. So um, he's going to talk to us this evening about his, his portfolio of work um, and especially this recent work, um, which we are going to be exhibiting at the Stained Glass Museum soon and we're very excited to see. So I will hand over to Petri, whose title of his talk is The Road to Podula. Thank you, Jasmine. In this uh, presentation, I'll start with a few of my notable commissions before going on to elaborate on some of my more recent autonomous panels. The title is maybe a little obscure. One of my ambitions is to create a body of works based on the Finnish folk epic, the Kalevala. I didn't want to just jump in with the same approach that I've used for much of my architectural commissions. Rather, I was keen to develop a style and approach that would be more applicable to a gallery or domestic setting. The Kalevala is a compilation of poetic stories rooted in the Finnish landscape with magical quests. It's this blend of nature and fantasy that are behind much of the imagery in the coming slides. Although none of the stained glass can be said to be a depiction of the Kalevala tales, it is my development of an artistic language to launch into this epic. The Kalevala book starts in a northern town called Pohjola, so the slides to come chart something in my journey to that starting point. This is one of uh, the first substantial stained glass windows I got to design and make. Now I'm terrible with dating my work, but as this was a millennium window, I'm guessing it must have been around the year 2000. It tells the story of the parish from its founding under the diocesan auspices of Lincoln and references its current diocese of St Albans. The two diocesan arms are depicted on the arms of the cross. Lincoln Cathedral is at the base of the cross, and various notable buildings and events are displayed in the sidelights. I use the sun and moon to give a sense of the passing of time from day to night, and I also use autumnal leaves and spring migrating swallows to further hint at the passage of time, referencing the equinox seasons. As a young, inexperienced designer, you can imagine the excitement of having your designs pass all the various committees. And it's still a thrill to have designs approved and quite humbling in a way, as nine times out of 10, it's a relative stranger trusting you enough to commit a substantial amount of money to your capabilities. My first East window was for St. Andrew's Church, Stansted Abbots. The brief for this window was the Holy Trinity, I've depicted the hands of the father cradling his precious earth. The central cross and the communion elements are going to trace really speak of Christ. The doves, the flames and the sense of flow down to the community below speak of the Holy Spirit. I've used radiating concentric rings centred on the um, cradled earth to give a sense of God's care spreading out almost like ripples through the cosmos. The parish also wanted this window to fulfil a very practical function. In the morning service, the low sun was blinding the congregants as it came through the east window, 
So to help alleviate this, I've used the deepest colours in the portion of the window where the morning sun was most piercing. Sometimes those initial client meetings throw up some interesting design requirements. This pair of windows were made for the Royal Hunting Lodge in Norfolk at Sandringham, and they show the late Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip's arms. They're located above a pair of French doors leading out from the small drawing room to the grounds. There's a strict formality to heraldry to determining the pose, positioning and colours to be used. But there's still room for certain stylistic flourishes within this language, as long as the protocols are respected. For this pair of windows, I've gone for an Edwardian style to complement similar heraldic panels in other parts of the lodge. This window shows Sir John, Stug uh, Sir John Major's arms and is installed on the landing of his Huntingdon home. Although I made the window, it was to a design by my mentor, Alf Fisher. Alf was one of the founding partners of Chapel Studio, where I started my career. John Major was a fan of cricket, so his shield is supported by a pair of crickets standing on dispatch boxes. And the usual four bar House of Commons portcullis has been changed to a three bar version to look more like cricket stumps. In case, and in case there was any confusion, we've also got three cricket balls. It wasn't the easiest to photograph, so I've included a few images here that between them show most of the aspects of the design. This pair of windows were commissioned to celebrate Michael Bear and Lord Levine's tenure as Lord Mayor of London in 2010 and 1998, respectively. They're set into steel frames and hung in front of existing leaded lights in St Botolph's Church or Gate. These photos were taken prior to installation, as the view of the leads beyond in their installed location is a little distracting to the eye. I think they had some issue with the faculty or they wanted to get things through speedily. I can't remember the exact reasons why it was hung in front, but that was a decision that was made. We had to go with it. I think in time they want to install them into the windows. And this pair of portraits was made to commemorate Sir John Studdard's tenure as Lord Mayor of London. Sir John was a member of the Worshipful Company of Glazers, and the left-hand panel is installed in the Library of Glazers Hall. The second panel was made for Sir John's homes. Home, sorry. These works are the first of mine to use, use techniques that I would go on to use extensively in my nature-inspired panels. The face is painted on a ruby flash glass that's been etched right back to the palest pink and then further micro etched to lighten the highlights on the forehead, nose and chin. The combination of shadow from the paint with the variation of hue from the etching give a unique quality to the three, of three, to the three dimensionality of the composition. I also use tiny vinegar washes to create the lace on the cuffs and the ruff. This technique of micro sh shading at the earliest trace paint stage of the painting process is also something I'll carry forward into much of my autonomous panel work. Here are a couple more portraits that I made. The one on the left is a portrait of my mum as a young girl. She was orphaned as a child uh, when Finland was at war with Russia. And escape uh, and was evacuated during the war years to live on a farm in Sweden. Our families kept in contact over the intervening years and on one visit to the farm we came across a pencil drawing of my mum in one of the old barns. This small panel was based on that drawing. The portrait on the right was made to promote my work in Central Asia, a part of the world that's very dear to me. This promotional piece is in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Both portraits, although very different in style, utilise delicate etching of flash glass to selectively lighten the hue. I particularly like the monochrome nature of my mother's portrait. It reminds me a lot of old sepia photographs, even though the colour palette is vastly different. Unfortunately, the Kyrgyz portrait didn't lead to any Central Asian commissions, but it did secure me the Sir John Stubbard Lord Mayor gig, so it wasn't wasted. This was my first nature-inspired autonomous panel. It's based on a photograph I took on a Finnish island on the edge of Helsinki. The mossy roots at the base of the window is painted on Lambert's streaky glass. 
I had to etch through the colour to lighten it in places. When I came to fire the trace paint, some of the newly exposed streaks metalled in the kiln and turned brown. I incorporated this into the design and painted a leaf around it. Sometimes when you ask a lot of glass, it can throw up unexpected opportunities or pitfalls. In this case, a bit of an opportunity. And there's a small woodland close to my home called Whippendale Woods. And this panel is based on an autumnal scene in that forest. With this design, I buried the lead matrix amongst the branches, something I felt worked well and took into many of my later compositions. By deviating from the more traditional mosaic approach of putting leads around most of the objects, I was able to go a lot more delicately with my trace lines. When the line work defines an object, then you really need to go quite heavy with the trace lines to counter off the halation effect. Light passing around a black line always makes the line look thinner. With these doves, I've used colour to define the birds, so the line work around the doves can be a lot thinner, giving the whole composition a more delicate feel. Also, the remainder of the trace lines throughout the panel don't have to compete in thickness with the lead work in quite the same way as a more traditional mosaic based approach. The slightly surreal lilac tree trunk was intended to be stained and come out sort of variations of various, various browns, but the pale stain didn't take. Um, in retrospect, I'm quite glad and like the effect, and this sparked the idea that I can be a lot more playful with colour in some of my future compositions. Another scene from Whippendale Woods, this time with a family of badgers. I thought it appropriate to represent the badger in stained glass in a stained glass composition, having given so much to the stained glass community. Where would we be without badger brushes? Again, the glass used is flash glass that's been etched to varying degrees. The deer on the left is painted on a Sanchez green flash and much of the green etched away where the deer is. I like to leave a little bit of the green shining through to prevent the etch portion from being too harsh in brightness. The pigment used to colour the deer is made by dissolving steel wool in vinegar. It takes several months to mature in the bottle and it gives this lovely earthy orange brown, not as bright or as dense as an amber stain. There are a few dots of this pigment throughout the panel on several of the autumnal leaves. And anyone wanting to make some of this pigment yourself be sure to leave the lid of the vinegar bottle loose as the solution gives off hydrogen gas as it dissolves and the gas needs to escape. If you don't do this, you end up making a bomb and I don't want you to make a bomb. When I go out to take my reference photographs, I'm always mindful of the time of day. Early mornings and late afternoons and sunny days work best for me. The long shadows give plenty of opportunity to bury leads in the compositions. Between this and the branches, I have ample opportunity. I'm always hypercritical of my work. And one aspect of this composition I feel doesn't quite work are the antlers of the, the deer in the front there. I etch the antlers lighter than the surrounding glass so that I could use the delicate trace line. I didn't quite etch enough away to sufficiently differentiate it from the green background. Having said that, I do like the color of the antlers. I think the solution would have been to just use a slightly thicker trace line around them. The way it is, it looks to me a little bit like those, um, those sort of funny years and antlers you get on, on, on stag nights and hen parties, <laughs> which you live and learn. And I've been learning a lot through these autonomous panels. Here is one of my favorites. The undulation in the moss beds gave me deep shadows to work with and really hone some of the processes I had developed. And here we have my compositional photo montage. You can see that I've emphasized shadows and contrasts on the glasswork compared to the base photo reference. If we just skip back to the previous slide, you'll, um, you'll see there's a lot more shadow there. In the, uh, in the ground and amongst the moss. And I often do that, I'll, I'll push a tonal paint right up to leads to, uh, to create more contrast. And it, it just works well in glass. And I like the, uh, the results. Right, so we go forward to the next one, which is, here we go, the links. 
One of my favourite places to photograph is Ashridge near Berkhampstead. It's a National Trust property in the Chiltern Hills. And where, mo where the moist air hits the hills, you get amazing moss covered trees with bracken ground cover. This environment is the home for my lynx, for my lynx family, sorry. I got the images of the lynx by pausing my TV while on a Nordic nature program was airing. And then I photographed the screen. It doesn't give for the best quality of photograph, but um, there's enough there to, uh, to be able to paint from. This is, now my, this is my now familiar palette of flash and streaky glasses, all cut and ready to be worked. And here is that same glass painted. And this is just awaiting the leading now. And this, the next slide is uh, the final leaded up panel. Right, fox and owls. I made this panel during the pandemic lockdown. It was a particularly divisive, intolerant time politically. You couldn't just have different opinions and then go on with things. Animosity was rife. With this composition, you have two differing wisdoms represented by owls, and they're eyeing each, each other up suspiciously. All the while, there's a predator fox waiting for his time to strike. The dense purple sky gives a heavy sense of foreboding. The fungi are in a way a beacon of hope. Yes, they're agents of decay, but they also take the old, repurpose it, and create a base for regeneration and new life. This is how many of my autonomous panels start. I use Procreate on the iPad to create a photo montage. This is less for design and more of something to aim at. It helps with the general layout, gives me enough detail to cut an etched glass, and still allows me to land the majority of my creativity on the glass rather than working it all out beforehand on paper. Often as flash glass is being etched, it throws up possibilities that I wouldn't have conceived on paper. Inevitably, it always seems to add something to the final work. Here we have all the glass cut. It's a mixture of flash and streaky mouthblown glass with a tiny bit of pot metal as well. And at this stage, I've etched, abraded, and engraved the flash glass. The gills on the underside of the, the back mushroom have been abraded with diamond hand files. That's a ruby on green glass. I've also put some Jean Cousin down on the fox and on the other mushroom. I like to fire polish my glass after etching and engraving. Not only does it give a nice surface to paint onto, it also throws up any potential metalling issues that some of the more obscure flash glasses can exhibit. The purple glass that the owls are on did metal in the kiln and developed an unpleasant dull metallic deposit on the etched area. I was able to remove it with a nitric acid etch. This dissolves the metal without touching the glass, so there's no reoccurrence of the metalling in subsequent firings. If you were to use a hydrofluoric acid to etch away the metalling, it would also take away this top, top layer of glass and expose another bit of uh, glass which is liable to, to metal in the kiln. So by using nitric acid, it only etches the, uh, the metalling, leaves the glass, the depleted metal glass as is, and there's no recurrence of metalling in subsequent firings. And here is that panel, all painted and stained, waiting for to be leaded up. Here's the final panel leaded. Metamorphosis was my submission for the recent BSMGP touring exhibition. For a small panel, it had quite a long story. The thoughts behind the panel were around the idea of a misunderstood individual emerging from the prison of other people's opinions. As they come out from their cocoon, their wings unfold, spread, and they get to live their best life. They're emerging from a world of decay with predators and scavengers in the shadows, but still they live free. Here we see the two original pieces of glass laid on top of each other. This is a plated piece. Both are flash and selectively etched awaiting the paintwork. The image on the left 
is an early progress photo of the trace painting, and on the right is a more advanced progress shot once the painting was complete. The next stage is to stain the back streaky glass, the back plate. And as you can see, the stain took well, but at quite a price. Unfortunately, the stress that went into the glass from the etching combined with the stain firing around the critical annealing temperature was all too much for this piece of glass. The ridge from the etching is quite visible, which gives an indication of how deep I had to etch to make any impression on this particular flash glass. And there's no way of recreating those exact streaks in a replacement piece. So a drastic rethink was in order. My solution was to replace the lovely streak glass with a piece of two mil flow glass, which I subsequently copper stained, silver stained and added blue enamel. The combination of pink copper stain and yellow silver stain gives a fantastic delicate orange. It's almost akin to a pale selenium color in hue, but a fraction of the cost and much more versatile to work with. Selenium flashes can be a swine to etch and they're prone to changing color in the kiln. Here we have the painted ruby layer sitting on top of the original streaky glass with the, the replacement piece just to the right. And here it is on top of the two mil flow glass. All in all, I'm more, more than happy with the change in direction. And I think the result worked well. I think in retrospect, some of those streaks would have been a little bit distracting on the, uh, on the paler mushroom. So yeah, I think sometimes when uh, mishaps happen and obstacles arise, they can actually lead to better outcomes. And I'm always, when, when things do go wrong, I always seek to see if there is a way to improve things. And I think this time it worked well, it worked in my favour. And here is the, um, the final piece with the lead work. Right, Bruckner's Fourth Symphony. This commission was quite a challenge. The client had seen several of my wildlife panels on social media and wanted to work using those sensibilities to relate to Bruckner's Fourth Symphony. On the left is my photo montage submission and on the right, the finished panel in its bespoke wooden frame and integrated LED light system. The symphony includes movements based around birdsong and also there's a hunt. Unfortunately, the photo on the right isn't the best. The colours aren't quite that saturated in, in real life. Just incidentally, the process for this one, I had to, I had to go through quite a bit of um, education with the client prior to... Uh, to, to make in the window, just to let him know that how I work with these autonomous panels, that when, you, when you're working with flash glass, you can never quite match the colors of, uh, of a photograph. There's always gonna be some deviation. And um, etching also is not the most exact science. So um, he, he had confidence in me that, you know, if I, if I embarked on this journey, I'd get a, a uh, I'd create something nice at the end of it, even if it wasn't exactly um, as the, uh, the design appeared when, it, when, it, when it's submitted. Here we see some progress shots as the paintwork progresses. In the left-hand photo, you can just see my iPad in shot. Because I don't have a conventional cartoon to reference during the painting, the iPad is my guide. I trace from a full-size grayscale printout of the photo montage and the rest is referenced through the iPad. It's my companion right from design through to every subsequent stage. To achieve the setting sun, I used a combination of delicately etched blue flash glass plated with two mil float that is low fired copper stain and pale silver stain. When I'm happy with the various elements, I edge bond the two layers using black silicon. I prefer black silicon over clear as I find it easier to spot any pinhole gaps that I might have missed. And incidentally on this one I did miss some gaps and uh, the lead light cement managed to seep between the layers so I had to dig a couple of pieces out, clean them up and uh, reinstall, reinstall them into, into the panel. And here's a detailed pic of how that plating works in the broader context of the rest of the panel. Who's that in the hollow? 
This was my submission panel for a charity auction in 2022 run by the American Glass Guild at a summer conference in Corning. Every piece of glass is plated in this panel. The paint and stain is all on, to, on a pieces of terminal flow glass and they've been plated with a variety of blue and purple flash glasses that have been selectively etched. My first firing is the copper stain, which gives a pinky hue. Once that fires, once that is fired, I go on to the trace paint. The top left image is the trace paint. This is my most laborious painting stage. As well as the dense vinegar trace line work, I also use a lot of tiny water, watery vinegary micro washes. Some are very pale indeed, but when but they give that little bit of tooth to the glass, so that when subsequent water and gum layers of paint are applied. They adhere that little bit more compared to areas of bare glass. The image top right has the flash glass laid on top of the paintwork, and the bottom right is just a tomb or float layer with the yellow stain now applied. These photos show the latter stages on the left with and without the silver stain, and then on the right, the completed panel will let it up. For this small forest scene, I return to more naturalistic colours. It shows a rare territorial dispute between a pair of badgers with a rather bemused deer in the background. Again, a mix of flash and streaky glass were used. On the right, the etching has taken place and I've added Jean Cousin to the deer and small flourishes of my steel wool pigment on parts of the foliage. Minor tragedy number two, again, my demands on the glass were a little excessive. There's obviously a reason why San Juice has stopped producing their green flash glasses. For my replacement piece, I used a slightly paler flash glass, which actually adds a little to the composition as it gives a greater sense of depth to the panel. Here we see the replacement piece at its trace stage in its context with the rest of the glass surrounding it. And there's a broken piece just underneath it. And here is the final, the completed panel. Buy one, get one free. I use the broken pieces instead for that round one on the right. And uh, yeah, nothing goes to waste. Right, the slime and unicorn montage was a springboard for the poster boy of my forthcoming exhibition at the Stained Glass Museum. I actually developed the theme several years ago, but never got round to making the panel. The thoughts behind the imagery were the rise to prominence of the younger generation of royals, a younger generation with modern aspirations born into an into institution with ancient protocols. I've taken the two heraldic supporters of the royal art coat of arms and liberated them from the strict heraldic protocols. When this panel was initially conceived, I had no inkling of how the royal story would develop. The unicorn is no longer chained and the lion wears its royal vestiture somewhat uneasily. You can see the crown is slightly, uh, slightly on the skew there. Here we have the now familiar early stage photos. I've utilised a lot more blue flash glass in this composition to allow for a fair amount of sky to peek through the trees. The upper corners of the window will be plated again with two mil flow glass to allow for a rich variety of autumnal hues. The addition of Jean Cousin and steel wool pigment further diversify the range of hues. And here are photos of the plating layers for the top right hand corner of the design. The first two photos on the left show the individual layers and the photo on the right shows the, the layers combined, one piece on top of the other. And the density of blue for the sky on the far right proved to be a bit too dense, so those pieces would need some further etching to lighten them. I really like the, um, the range of greens I'm able to get by plating in, excuse me, in this way. Um, you get some really lovely quiet greens by plating them with the, with the pink and the, and the yellow, silver and copper stains. So. Yeah, it just opens up a whole realm of possibilities by plating. You can do a lot, a lot more color wide by using two layers of glass. 
Here we see some of the trace painting in progress. The yellow tree trunk on the top left is an error. Um, I stained a bit of glass where I shouldn't have. That's on the two mil flow glass. So I had to etch that stain away a little bit. Um, and here is the finished work. And I was really pleased with the quality of forest light that came through. And that additional bit of etching on the sky made a world of difference. They, they were fade far too blue before. Sometimes as well, you get little unexpected effects which you don't, you haven't planned for. And if you look at that really thick, dense uh, tree on sort of on the left hand side, just to the right of that, there's a bit of streaky glass. Now I, I cut that piece of glass just to get variety in the greens, nothing more, I didn't really think of it, but the way the streaks lay, it almost looks like rays of, of light uh, coming down through the forest and that's completely unintentional, but uh, yeah, it's a delight when those little um, unforeseens happen and uh, just add something to, to the composition. I wanted to engage with some figures that were a bit more fantastical than on some of my previous panels. For this work, I looked to centaur-like creatures. Contemporary TV culture seems awash with exploitative formats that manipulate affections for mass entertainment, frequently causing mental toil for the participants. I thought to use centaurs to help visual visually play some of this dynamic out. These half man, half beast figures have an association with ancient mythology. So as a playful twist, I also included the lab mouse that they used to grow uh, a human ear on, a very contemporary man beast mashup, pulling the scene here into the here and now. So just there on the left hand side, you'll see this little funny mouse with an ear on his back. Um, pretty gruesome, really. I thought to include a couple of images showing the type of printout I use to create my working drawings for these pieces. I've got a, a Hewlett Packard uh, printer that prints out onto a 39 centimetre wide roll of paper. The paper I use is tracing paper, which makes the glass paint tracing a whole lot easier than if I was to use regular paper. I then make a tracing paper cut line, which I pencil where I have to etch or engrave. This means all my etching runs through when it comes to leading up the panel. I use pencil as much of the etching happens in, in uh, several stages, so I can rub out the previous etch guidelines and put in the subsequent ones. When it comes to the engraving though, um, sorry, when it comes to engraving through flash, I do that underwater to keep the diamond burr cool. Not quite like this underwater but more like this. I use a transparent Perspex tray with just enough water to cover the surface of the glass. The tray is on my light table so I can see exactly where I'm what I'm engraving and the thin layer of water helps remove any debris as I proceed. The engraving tool has a flexi shaft so the electric motor is well away from the water. The motor is hanging somewhere above my head and it's just the mechanical end with a diamond burr that gets a little wet. This photo on the left is the other end of the engraver. It's a good robust bit of kit. It comes with a foot pedal so you can devote both hands to holding and engraving the glass. What's a little hard to see in the photo is the handle at the top which allows you to hang the motor above your working area. The other photo shows various diamond burrs which go into the, the business end and some 3M diamond files which are used for hand abrading flash glass away. The narrow red file in the middle there has been cut to a point to make a nice controllable shape for delicate work. And if you want to go and explore these hand abrading techniques further, I highly recommend Judith Schechter's YouTube channel. She really pioneered these processes and pointed me in the right direction through her videos. Back to the glass. Here we see the panel taking shape. On the bottom left, two pieces of glass, you can see thin pale lines. This is where I've engraved the flash. The rest of the, uh, the lightning was done using hydrofluoric acid. The body of the bull is plated. I've used a pale gray-green pot metal glass plated with a two mil float glass. 
The flow glass has been copper stained twice to get the pink and the red. And I've got as many brush strokes as possible in the portion below the ball to maximize variation in hue. And that, that area beneath the ball will be autumnal fern. So I wanted a nice sort of crunchy, crunchy looking stain, red stain down there. This picture is uh, nearing completion. We're just awaiting the, the silver stain, the yellow stain to be added. And here is the finished piece. And there again, there's that little mouse with an ear on the branch on the left-hand side. Nearly finishing up, this is the last but one slide. I thought it might be interesting to see um, the steel wool pigment I make up close and see, see what effect it has. Uh, so this figure has Jean Cousin on the front for the flesh tone and the steel wool derived pigment fired onto the back to help differentiate the beard from the flesh. The second image, the one on the right, shows the back of the glass in reflected light. And you can see it's almost like a luster the way this, um, this uh, steel wool pigment fires in. And this is the last slide, one last slide to finally finish with. And this is a shameless plug for the upcoming exhibition at the Stained Glass Museum running through from spring to summer. Thank you very much. Thank you, Petri, so much um, for that wonderful walkthrough, um, not only the kind of body of work that you've created com for commissions, but this recent body of work and the processes um, making it um, really fantastic to see um, illustrated so clearly your, your unique processes, really. The whole photo montage uh, to the use of the flashed glass, um, the, the engraved engraving of the glass itself, and then the plating, and, and the way that you paint as well, um, without a cartoon or, or just the guiding lines of the pieces of glass and um, kind of freehand painting these pieces, which um, is incredible really, as well as your own painting techniques using that steel wool pigment, um, Jean Cousin the Stain, which is uh, quite a unique combination. So really fascinating for all of us to hear. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. I will invite people to um, ask Petri questions by putting them in the Q&A um, now, and we'll be able to see them and put them to him. Um, and I will also uh, kick off, as I usually do, with my own questions. <laughs> okay. Hope that's okay, Petri. Yeah. Um, and actually, the first question I have is about the placing of the lead lines. You said a couple of times um, in this series, especially of work, that you wanted to kind of deviate from the mosaic effects, and you talked about burying leads in the compositions. And um, the leads kind of are a bit hidden, or almost like um, looking at enamel painted 18th century glass, where mm. the lead lines aren't completely structural or, or aesthetic. And I just wondered if you might say a bit more about how you choose where to put lead lines. Yeah, it's, it's all about following shadows and just finding ways, areas where they're best hidden. And sometimes there isn't an obvious place um, within the photo montage to, to really hide a lead line. But often I find I can push tonal paint right up against the lead uh, on the surrounding pieces. So it almost becomes uh, an edge of a shadow. And um, that's one technique I tend to use to, 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 to disguise the leads, to hide the lead in the composition. Some, some leads do run along the edge of objects, um, but um, wherever possible, I, do, I, do try, I, I make a lot of the branches as well. They're really helpful in, in hiding leads. A lot of when I, a lot of the photos that I take my my starting photos when I go into the forest, I photograph in a certain angle relative to the sun, so that you tend to get just a glancing light on the edge of the branch. And so you might get a bit of moss on the top of the branch, but the branch looks pretty black. So I can then use that branch as a lead, and just use a little skim of green flash across the top, to, just a highlight of moss to show that it's not just a, a black branch. And it, it just, yeah, the, the, those are the, the, the two main techniques which I use to, to disguise the lead in these compositions. Thank you. And um, I don't think dimensions were on the screen and it's always hard to imagine when you're looking on a screen. Could you give 
people a bit of a sense of the the average size of these pieces oh um they're um probably probably about the larger ones would be about um 60 centimeters across um the lot that the biggest one up that's on this um slideshow was the finish one and that was 1200 by 600 um and the um the, the owls and the doves that's a 600 by 600 and then most of the others are slightly smaller than that quite quite sizable pieces um and i think i'm right in saying that the first one you produced the the vertical one um you produced it kind of for yourself as an exhibition piece it wasn't a commission that's um right. yeah and and this whole series seems to be a kind of labor of love it's that it's the work that maybe you want to to create what's what's the inspiration you mentioned your woodlands could you say a bit more about um the inspiration especially for the fantastical creatures and beings that we're, we're seeing in, in in these later works well in the back of my mind i'm always thinking of how i'm gonna make these color color panels and there are some quite amazing exploits these various characters in, in the story go through so um some of these um less than natural beasts they they sort of they're of they're of that sort of genre if you know what i mean um so they yeah they, the, the thought of creating um pieces which which would work well with with a color color background are, are always in the back of my mind um and i just love forest my, my, my heritage is um, half finnish so finland is a land of lakes and forests so um yeah i think it's in my blood a little bit to to get in in amongst the trees and uh and show them in my work. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Grace. He says, your techniques are phenomenal. Thanks for sharing. And um, I'm sure she's not alone in saying that it's much appreciated by a glass technique nerd and any artists who are here, I'm sure I've really appreciated that breakdown. Um, she says, the autonomous panels and their narratives are captivating and stunning. And she's very interested to see how you're gonna develop these further and the direction that this type of work will lead to. Uh, she's looking forward to seeing them up close at the museum. Grace, please oh, do come well, and visit them. I think also it's, it's, it's great to be able to see these panels in the context of the lineage of stained glass throughout the centuries. And for me, it's a real privilege to, to be asked to, to put some in, into the museum because, you, you know, people who visit to, to look at uh, my work, they're, they're going to see so much more on, on that visit with all the rest of the class that's there. So it's going to be real, a real visual treat for anyone going, I think. Yeah. And you mentioned a bit the reception because you clearly had a commission from the back of people looking on social media, um, the commission you showed for the for the landscape scene. Um, mm. The reception seems to have been pretty positive. I know that I was really attracted to exhibit the woodland scenes um, and I imagine this the fantastical creatures have kind of uh, got a, a different kind of audience, um, an extended audience than the, just the animals um, themselves. But the, we're going to get lots of questions, I think, about them. Mm, yes. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, if you have any questions, because I can't see any more in the chat, so please, if you do have any questions, even if it's just a question about uh, a technique that you didn't understand or uh, Petri's work uh, more broadly, uh, this is your opportunity so don't miss out and i will ask a question while you're thinking um petri of all the techniques that you went through in the processes of making a panel do you have a favorite stage um i, I enjoy every stage um i think the most challenging stage is at the beginning when i've got all the glass cuts because i always have the same feeling i look at this mixture of glass which bears very little resemblance to what I'm aiming for. And, you know, I've, I've, I know I've done pieces before, and but I, I always think, <laughs> how am I going to get from here to there? Because um, oh, I, do, I do change the colours substantially during the process using painting or staining or adding Jankusan or these other pigments. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of, excitement and a little bit of trepidation just can I can I make this work and in one sense it's not too bad when it's just an autonomous panel because if it doesn't work no one gets to see it 
but if it's for a commission and that circular panel was, you know, I, that had to work, that I couldn't mess up on that because the, 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 the client had uh, seen the, uh, the photo montage and had committed the money. So, and, and all of them have worked eventually. Some have gone slight detours and I've had to make some changes to make them work. They always have worked, but it's, um, it's always the daunting stage for me when, when the glass is there in front of me all cut and uh, not really looking that much like the finished piece. And uh, yeah, I, I, mean, I, love, I love the challenge. You know, it's, not, it's, not a, it's, not, it's not like a, it, it racks me with fear or anything, but it's, um, yeah, it's just... Uh, it's, yeah. it's interesting that chimes with what other artists that we've had talk in this series were saying about working with glass. And I think you really nicely showed some examples of happy accidents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes an accident is frustrating and it puts you back and you have to think of a way around. And other times it's a happy accident that you didn't even realize was going to be part of the piece, like that flashed piece of glass that, that looked like the sunlight coming through. A um, couple of questions coming through now. Uh, Pippa Stacy asks, could you explain your steel, wool and vinegar technique in more detail, please? Ah, right. I thought someone might ask me about that. So I came with my bottle of potion. <laughs> it is. Doesn't look like much. So basically, I, I just got a bottle of vinegar and stuff a load of steel wool in as much as I could. I could fit. So I'd probably take about that much out of the bottle to allow for the steel wool. Then just pile it in there and leave it. Leave it in the bottle. I have to leave the lid off loose, and um, and uh, and it matures. This is about two years old now. I'm getting towards the end. I'm going to, have to start making some more. And when I come to use it you want to have your piece of glass on as flat a surface as possible because what you do is you, you sort of puddle this on so you know how when you get a water droplet you get that little dome don't you um like a meniscus dome um that's that's what you want with this so you you you've got a, a little dome of this of this solution where you want it and then you just have to leave it to dry and if the surface isn't perfectly flat then it sort of goes to one end and it doesn't dry evenly so you get an uneven um an even wash of, of of this pigment and it, it really works best in small areas um, when you try and do a large area with it then inevitably it will dry deeper one end than, than the other and um yeah it won't be the best so that's that's how i use it and then i fire it in at um paint temperature about for my in my kiln it's about 680 excuse me, 680 degrees Celsius. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's how it works. And it, it stays as well. So you can, uh, uh, you can do it as your first fire and you can do it as your last firing and it won't change too much in the kiln. I tend to do it quite early on because I like to have all my colour where I need it at the paint, or at least as much of it where I need it at the painting stage. Um, but sometimes I've used it later on in the process as well, and it's worked just as fine. And then the, you get a, lot of, a little bit of excess, so I use a little bit of steel wool just to wrap off the excess after my final firing. Sometimes nothing rubs off, sometimes there's a little bit to wrap off. But, um, yeah, so that's how I use it. What temperature do you file it at, um, Petrie? Uh, 680, about 680. It's, it, it's whatever temperature you fire your uh, paint at. Every kiln is slightly different. So for my kiln, it's around 680. Um, and because, excuse me, I'm, I'm not an artist. Is this a technique that has been around for a long time or is this completely something you've um, developed yourself? As far as I know, it's something I've developed myself. Um, yeah. So I, you know, I, I've not heard of anyone, else, anyone using it before me. I think a few people are using it, have been using it since. I mentioned it on social media. Yeah. Um, and I think a few people in America have, have picked up on it and have, have tried it. It was very generous for you to talk openly about it because I know sometimes these things are protected secrets. Um, and and feel feel free to to stop answering questions about it if you feel uncomfortable. Um, no, there is one more. Uh, and and asks what grade of steel will do you use or or does it not matter? I don't think it matters too much. Um, if you go for the finest you can get hold of, then that's the greater surface area, so it's going to work quicker. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll go for the, the finest uh, steel wool you're able to get. Some people who've 
who mm. made themselves, they, they said they, they found it a little hard, a little bit hard to dissolve. Mm. And it might be that some brands have got some sort of oil coating mm. to prevent it from um, rusting. So, um, but I think if you just leave it a little bit longer, it'll, it'll eventually get there. I actually, the, the, the way I came across this in the first place was I made this mixture to um, silver some old pine because carpenters use this mixture. And it's actually the same mixture that ebonizers use when they want, want to ebonize wood. It works for the tannins and uh, makes the tannins go black or on, on hardwoods or on softwoods. It, it, it makes a uh, softwood go silver. So that's why I had some in the first place to, for, to age some wood. And I thought, what happens if I put this in glass and fire it? Amazing history. <laughs> a happy accidental invention. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. Um, and it, it takes on float glass as well as blown glass. Um, I'm not sure I ever tried it on float glass. I don't see why it wouldn't. I, I, um, I tend to use it on on mouth blown glasses, but I think it will probably work on float as well. Mm. Great. Couple more uh, questions. Um, someone asks about plating, and we can explain that plating glass is basically more than one layer of glass. You're working with two layers. You have two pieces of glass that are placed on top of one another. Yeah, it just gives a whole a whole lot more opportunities and, um, with color combinations on what appears to be a single piece of glass because you've got two pieces of glass, both of which you can etch down so you can lighten the color of both. Both you can stain and um, yeah, just it opens up a whole realm of colour possibilities within a single piece of glass. Mm. And do you have a favourite type of glass that you use and are there any types of glass that you avoid using? Uh, because I, these autonomous panels are to be seen up close, um, I try to use glass that I can fit in a regular lead. If you go for a wider heart lead, then it can look a bit heavy. Um, so if I've got, when I'm, when I'm selecting flash glasses, I tend to look for the thinnest flash glass I can find. So if I get a, a flash glass, it's somewhere between two and three mil, and then I've plated it with a bit of two mil glass, I can still fit that combined two layered piece of glass in a piece of lead with a five mil heart. So. Yeah, that's that's what I tend to look for. Flash glasses that are a bit um, a bit thinner than than your average. And I also look for strange flashes. If there's a flash glass which hasn't quite worked um, for the you know in the way that the, the glass blower wanted it to, often that's the glass which I'll go for because it's a bit different, it's a bit obscure, and uh, and you can do more things with it. It's it's just un more unusual. And that Lord Mayor's Commission. Um, uh, the the scabbard of, of his sword is a lovely Elizabethan uh, red velvet which is aged through the centuries, and that and there are these tiny little pearls on the scabbard as well. And uh, I, when I when I took the photograph at the mansion house, I knew there was no way I was going to match that colour. And then I went to English Antique Glass, and they would experiment with trying to get some ruby flashes, and they, they weren't getting the hang of it at all. The glasses they produced were just the right colour for this scabbard on the Lord Mayor's portrait. So um, yeah, if there's a if there's a flash glass which is out of the ordinary, there we go, that's the one. So that scabbard that he's holding there on the sword, that's a bit of ruby flash, copper ruby, which never quite went ruby, went more of a brownie red, brownie maroon, and uh, it was just right for um, yeah for that piece. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Petri, for sharing um, your amazing skills and techniques and, and talking us through this, this body of work. Um, as we said, the Stained Glass Museum is hosting an exhibition of Petri's um, woodland scenes um, very soon, actually, from the 8th of April, and it will run through um, until the autumn. So um, do come and visit us. Um, if you don't know where we are, we are located um, in the Stained Glass Museum um, in Ely Cathedral. Um, we have a long gallery there full of amazing stained glass from the 13th century 
right up to the present day. And we're committed to also showing contemporary work um, through exhibitions and also acquiring contemporary works uh, where we can. So um, it's not just old glass, we do the very old to the very new. And I've just done those slides backwards, so forgive me. I've been, and if the slides were out of sync, that's also uh, my fault, but I hope they were mostly in sync for you this evening. Um, if you're interested in finding out more about the museum, please do visit our website. Um, and if you care about stained glass, it's a great charity to support by becoming a friend for not much a year. Um, we are an independent museum and charity, so all of our money comes from paying visitors grants and donations. So by attending this talk, you're supporting the museum and we're very grateful to you for attending and to Petri for agreeing to speak to us. So I will thank you all again. Thank you, Petri. Thank you. And say good night, everyone.